Spirit, we just welcome you in this place this morning. God, to an extent, I, I thank you that you are pushing us out of our boundaries and the boxes that we may have placed you in. That worship takes many forms, perhaps even endless forms. That we serve a God who creatively designed us to worship him and to experience him in thousands and thousands of different ways. And so this morning, we are just partnering with you, Holy Spirit. Would you guide our thoughts? Would you guide our words? Would you guide our actions? And ultimately, God, would you speak to us and would you transform our hearts this morning? And so as we go into this this first segment of Lectio Divina, which if you're unfamiliar unfamiliar with it, uh, essentially that's the Latin translation of divine reading. And so this is a practice that the church has been participating in since the 6th century, so it's a good 1,400 years of history there. Um, And so we're partnering with the history of the church in a practical way of interpreting the scripture, of gleaning from scripture, of listening to God, of contemplating the goodness of God and what he has for us. And so there's a few steps to it. Um, If you want to grab your Bibles, open up your apps. Uh, The verse that we're going to be reading today is first in first Thessalonians chapter five. And we're going to be doing verses 12 to 25. And so how this is going to go is there's the first step, which I'm going to just read this to you. And so some of you, you may feel as though you want to read along with your Bible. Other, others of you, you can just listen to my words. But cr- we're just creating a space for God to speak to you through this passage this morning. And so passage this morning, read along, listen. I'm going to read this first, and then we're going to go into the next step. And so it says, this is in the NIV translation, by the way. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good, Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. So now, we're gonna, I'm going to read that again, but... I want you to focus on a word or a phrase that strikes you. So if you're reading, if that's text that that strikes you, or as I'm speaking, if that's a word that just, it's something that for whatever reason you feel like, I need to hold on to that a moment longer. Or Or there's something behind that word or phrase that's specifically for me tonight. Or this morning, sorry. And so... The, the cool thing is, it's not going to be the same word or phrase for us in here. God has something different for each one of us that he wants to highlight, that he wants us to um, reflect on and to be transformed by. So as I'm reading, when a word or a phrase strikes you, stop and rest with it. Repeat the word or phrase to yourself and allow it to speak to you in a personal way by pondering it, reflecting on what it means to you, memorize it, repeat it to yourself, allow it to interact with your hopes, your desires, your dreams, and your memories. 
And so even before I, I read it again, God, I pray that within this, this passage that we're reading, there's something for everyone here, God. I pray that this wouldn't just be a, a mundane morning, God. But Father, I pray that as we are as we are contemplating your words, your scripture, would we be captivated once again? I pray for God, I pray for those of us that are in here that maybe the Bible has lost a little bit of its touch, so to speak. That maybe we've lost a, a little bit of the desire or the passion to read the scriptures. God, I pray that there would be a reinvigoration this morning. Yes. That we would be recaptivated by you, by your words, by your scripture. And would we pause and would we give space and would we reflect on whatever you may have us reflect on? Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, Warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. So again, just pause and reflect. What is the word or the phrase that stood out to you? Visualize it. Allow it to actually touch your heart. Let's not just read this and move on. with God that comes from your heart. So we are going to formulate a prayer as a response to God in this moment. So we are are going to ask, God, what do you want to say to the Lord in response to the word spoken to you? In this moment, what do you want to say in response to God for the word or phrase that was spoken to you? In essence, this is a a call to action. This is a call to go beyond just reading and receiving, but this is a call to say, okay, God, this is is what I'm going to do in spite of this. What do you want to say to the Lord right now? Once you have something, once you feel as though there's a prayer that is formed in your heart, I want you within your cohorts, um, the people that you feel safe with, to just share what that prayer is. And we're going to take five minutes or so and we're just going to share with each other, hey, first this is the text and or the word that was highlighted to me that I felt like God was asking me to kind of focus on. 
And next, this is, this is my response to that phrase or text. This is my prayer to the Lord in this moment. So go ahead. So this doesn't have to be like depressing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like depressing. <laughs> like this can be like there's I want to hear some laughs about what God is sharing to you through this passage. It doesn't have to be this. I think oftentimes we hear like, oh, this is like Latin. Like you hear Latin and you're like, oh, okay, we gotta buckle down. Like this is a serious moment. Once we start translating from Latin, like but no, this is this is a this is worship. So again, it can be that it can be a really serious, deep moment with the Lord. But at the same time, it needs to be infused with joy. So, feel free to share and laugh with one another. Okay, what is it that God is sharing to you from this passage? And I'm actually going to read it again quickly. So now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, and be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. share what I what was highlighted to me um, the at the very tail end of it in verse 23 it says may God himself the God of peace and the word himself actually it was really highlighted to me it's as I was reading it it's something that typically I think I would gloss over that word may God himself because easily that translation could have said may God the God of peace but it says may God himself and I think there's a personal aspect to that, the vocabulary that is used there. Did you, did you know that God himself is right here in this room? Not this like concept off in the distance of God, the word God that we may, we may use over and over again. And we can oftentimes forget the personability of God. God himself, Jesus Christ himself, the Trinity itself, is right here in this moment and they want to speak to you. And that the God himself is the God of peace. That's the following line. He is he is a God of peace. He is not it is not a characteristic in itself, but God is actually peace. In his very essence is peace. And I know specifically with whatever is going on around us politically and with COVID and with the strife that we may experiencing relationally or with work or with school, sometimes we need God himself, the God of peace, to come through in our lives. Yeah. 
And so the last step, and if you haven't shared your prayer with someone, feel free to do that as I'm doing this. It's, but the last step is rest in God's presence and receive his transforming embrace. Realizing that in this deep and profound relationship, words are not necessary. Be content and at peace with a wordless, quiet rest in God, which brings joy to the heart. And remember that contemplation is not your action or doing. Rather, it is allowing God to act in you. Contemplation is not your action, your doing. Oh, I just need to like, I just need to sit down in silence for 30 minutes and then I'm going to be good. No, it is God working in you in your own heart. And so God, this morning I pray as worship may look a little bit differently. Would you work and would you move and would you weave and would you prune and grow in our hearts? And as we read in 1 Thessalonians, God, would the God of peace himself be with us? transition to the next segment of worship we have feel free to just stay in this place if you're still thinking about the verse if you're still contemplating it if you still want to share with someone what god is teaching you or what you're going to do in light of what god has shared to you it's totally open to do that but we're just going to open up more avenues of worship as well in this time so we're actually going to start by dismissing our kiddos this morning have fun guys we might be doing some similar stuff as you guys are downstairs. <laughs> so, this morning we are actually going to worship with God in even more creative ways. Um, we have a couple stations. Um, we have a couple stations in the back, and we have one by the door. Um, so, what we're going to do is we're actually just going to worship by just communing with God through creativity. And that can look like a couple of different things. Um, so this back table over here near Dave, Dave, why don't you wave? This is going to be um, a station where we have some journal prompts for you guys. Um, so you can actually just journal on your own with the Lord. And even if you want to expand on maybe what you've been meditating on this morning, you can do that. Or however you want to express yourself to the Lord, just write him a letter or even ask him to give you words over yourself. That's something you can do. Um, but there's also journal prompts back there that will lead you into um, a guided journaling session with the Lord. It's really, really powerful. Something I practice at home myself. Um, the next table over as well. Um, yeah, just want to, that's perfect with the, where the crayons are. So you can also journal, I'm sorry, draw with the Lord. So you can ask him to give you a picture of what is on his heart this morning, or maybe ask him for a word over yourself. And if, as he gives you a picture, you can just draw it out. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be a masterpiece. It's just an avenue for you to commune with the Lord. Um, you can also use the journal prompts for this as well. And then the next station, I believe, is that's the journaling station, sorry. The next station over here by the exit is going to be prayer. So if you guys want to spend this the next probably five, ten minutes in prayer, there's some sheets of paper over there or some sticky notes, and you can just drop them in the box when you're done. And we're actually going if to, you, if you would like to share them, we'll actually post them on the wall for a prayer wall. Um, and then the other thing you can do is actually just meditation. So I'm just going to be staying here. I'm going to be playing over you guys as you guys are staying here. I'm going to be playing over you, selecting what avenue you want to worship with God this morning. So you can just stay and you can meditate on, on scripture, um, or you can just um, reflect and just sit in your seat and allow him to speak to you personally. So whatever, if there's any station that um, was speaking to you, I just invite you guys just to just to engage with the Lord this morning in a different form of worship. It can be super, super fun. So what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to ask this section to go first, and then maybe, Tim, if you want to dismiss the rest so I can continue playing. Um, and we'll, we'll take about five or ten minutes 
just to commune with the Lord and worship with him in this avenue. Does that sound good, church? Awesome. Yeah, Lord, so we just, we welcome you into our creativity this morning, God. And we thank you that you are always teaching us new ways of worship, God, that it's not just a song, it's not just singing, but it's actually communing with you in every moment and giving us the revelation that every moment is holy in our lives, Lord. So as we put our hands to new things this morning, God, I just pray that you would encounter each and every person in this room this morning, that you would encourage them with your word, that you encourage them with your presence. And God, you are speaking to each one today. So I just pray for open ears, open hearts.
about a mom and her kid, and I'm like, oh, this has had nothing to do with me. But um, <laughs> the, the heart of the, the prompt was about regret. And I felt like there is someone in here or many in here, um, and the Lord is saying it's time to let go of regret. That regret has actually been holding you back. this morning looks different, but God, I pray that that difference would make a difference. <clears throat> would you just, would you just rip up any box that we've put you in where we've said connection has to rely on singing or connection has to rely on a certain substrate of worship, but no connection is here and it's now and it's always working and it's always moving. God, would, would we feel the union of us with you? Would we be unified with you, God? Would the lines that we've drawn that separate us be erased?
Thanks, Cody. That was beautiful. Um, how many of you appreciated that new that new uh, flow this morning for worship? I, I really did. I know it's, it's an exercise sometimes of just being uh, being able to calm your mind um, and to take the thoughts of the day and of the week and to put them into a place where we can actually uh, make space for, for the Lord to speak. Um, we might just do this next Sunday too. Uh, activate some of this uh, this strategy into uh, into our lives. But Cody, thank you for leading us in that. Uh, my name is Tim. As Cody just mentioned, if I have not met you yet, um, we are with this incredible team of leaders uh, on a journey right now as a church uh, moving towards uh, building a, building an environment and a community that um, that's safe, that has um, a strong conviction to build a place of belonging and community and a sense of uh, being a part of, of something bigger than yourself, bigger than your own needs, although every need that is present in this room, God sees and hears and desires to, to meet those needs, but sometimes just immersing yourself into something bigger than what we feel and see around us uh, actually helps us get through the challenges of our everyday, being and hearing God's heart for this community, Clarney Glengarry for our city and our province, our country. Uh, we are a church that desires to be a part of things that make a difference, that give space for Holy Spirit to um, to work through us. And I know, I don't even have to say it, but I know that there is a huge need right now for um, for culture, for, for society that surrounds us to grab on to hope, something that, that can bring hope to the situations around us. Who agrees? And Cody mentioned it right at the end there about wisdom. That's what I'm going to land on for a few minutes today. Uh, we've been talking about the prophetic. Uh, just a few weeks ago, Luke was with us and laid a foundation of the history of prophetic ministry. And scripturally as well, Old Testament versus New Testament. If you've not listened to that message, I encourage you to do so. CLACalgary.com is where you can find uh, our website. And last week, Nadia continued in the conversation with uh, health is the way forward. We want to build a healthy, uh, life-giving environment here, as I said, that makes room for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And as I've been thinking about this and reflecting on the book of James, as you know, we've been diving into this fall. Uh, there is a very key section of scripture in chapter three that talks about the spirit of wisdom. And I believe wisdom is so partnered with the prophetic gift as well as words of knowledge it's almost like when we're given these things and when the Lord highlights uh, and encourages us, it's the wisdom that, that helps us uh, walk it out and to figure out how to take what we've heard and what God has shown us and move us in the ne into next steps into finding how to reveal these things in our everyday. I wrote it like this where prophecy may speak of future, but words of wisdom help us understand how to get there. The application of God's word to us. and Even words of knowledge may reveal truth about our past, but a word of wisdom will tell us how to break through into our present, into our future. We need wisdom. Who agrees? Wisdom and discernment right now is probably one of the most important things uh, to help us navigate through these very trying days. Um, as you know, and I've said this over these weeks, that James is a very unique book of, of Scripture. It's found in the New Testament. It's written for a very practical time 
back then, which relates to today, a time of a scattered generation, a scattered people. Uh, I think that we can certainly relate to that. It speaks uniquely to our current situation that is upon us. And that's why we are coming in and out of this book through these weeks to receive teaching from the Lord through a very wonderful book. If you've not been reading, James, I encourage you to do so. Uh, These chapters have so much value. And I want to start off this morning with a question that we actually do find in James chapter 3. It starts like this, who is wise and understanding among you? Verse 13, it says, who is wise and understanding among you? What James is saying here is that there is value in wisdom during chaotic times. This is not wisdom being defined as experience or intellect or knowledge. This is different. You respond to chaos in a different way when you have the spirit of wisdom working in your life. The Hebrew word for wisdom is, It means you have a unique skill in living. That's what it actually means. A unique skill in living. You don't develop the skill. God actually gives you the mind of Christ. That's the spirit of wisdom. That's why the book of Proverbs says that wisdom is supreme. And it's why one person reacts one way and another person reacts another way to the very same situation or circumstance. It's what what are you allowing to guide you through the challenges of your life? It goes on to say there, let them show their wisdom by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. I believe we are going to receive wisdom today. And I want to pray as I spend a few minutes in this passage this morning. If you desire to receive the wisdom of the Lord in your life, to be active in your every day, just encourage you to um, just get into a posture of receiving right now. Father, I thank you that it is your heart for us not to walk each day with our earthly lenses where we see things in the natural. Yes, there's value in that, but when we partner what we see in the natural with what you are showing us through your spirit, we can walk with a wisdom and with a discernment that can help us get through anything where we can respond in a way that brings hope to the people around us, where we can react to our spouse or to our children with grace and with patience just because we are allowing you to speak to us and through us as we navigate through our days. I pray today that the spirit of wisdom would rest on each person. Amen. I want to explain one thing to us today, that wisdom is just is more than just me teaching from book of James, showing you and communicating some great things this morning. I believe that there's a portion of wisdom that I can pass off to you, but when you go home this week and you give this a practice in your life and you allow the Lord to speak to you, this, my friends, is pure Christianity. Surrender from your own strength, from your own thoughts, from your own ideas, from your own experiences. Christianity is not you becoming a new and improved you because you worked harder and tried something and read some verse and prayed some prayer and showed up at CLA today. That's not what it is. Christianity is a transformed life where God will do some things inside you where you won't even recognize yourself. He'll teach you things. He'll fill you with his spirit. He will make you brand new. And he doesn't just do this by giving us a bunch of rules and saying, try to become more religious and follow these things and see 
if that will help. No, no. It says, if any man be in Christ, there there are a brand new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all is brand new. God will turn something old into something that you don't even recognize. And that's my desire for my life and for all of your lives. I'm not the same person that I was a year ago or five years ago and certainly not 20 years ago. We are continually being transformed by the Lord. And it's not about being better than this person or that person or trying to create that narrative. That's not it at all. I, I do believe this, and I wrote this up on the screen, that God doesn't make me better than everyone else. He actually makes me better than myself. That's what it's about, focusing in on you and on your journey with Jesus. I want us all to make room in our heart for God to transform our hearts today. God, would you impart these principles, impart these teachings, into each of us this morning. Have you ever known anyone to look at you and claim to be wise, but they act so foolish? Here's what the opposite produces. The Bible says this here in James verse 14. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such Wisdom does not come from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, even demonic, devilish conniving, other versions say. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder in every evil practice. Wherever you try to look better than others, things will fall apart, the message says. And everyone will end up at each other's throats. The truth is that genuine wisdom from above can be measured by the depth of one's character. Like we identify fruit on a tree each year, you can evaluate the wisdom manifested from your life by the way that you act and the way you respond and the way that you function every day. It's a big tell. I've had a unique year like all of us have here in 2020. So much challenge, so much unknown combined with continually having to make decisions on the go for my own marriage, my own family as well, for this beautiful church that we all love. It has not been easy, but God has gone with us. And I'm dedicating these thoughts this morning, all of them, to all of you who have had a life of of disorder this year. I think we can relate to that. So what do we do if we're struggling in this area? If we go back to James chapter 1 verse 5, it says, If anyone lacks wisdom, you should what? Ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you, the promises. And that's what we're going to do today for these few minutes, where I want to challenge some of our worldly way of thinking and allow God to impart into our hearts wisdom that comes from the Lord. Verse 17 of chapter 3 says, But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit. It's impartial and it's sincere. And then look at the twist at the end of this passage, which at first glance doesn't feel like it fits, but I'll get to this in a few minutes. It says, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. I want to go back for these few minutes that we have and go through this list of attributes, of what wisdom looks like. And I want to ask you to do two things this morning. I want you to learn from this passage and then allow God to impress on your heart so that your life can be transformed from the inside out. It's twofold. We learn and then we activate and allow God to speak to us. The first thing that we see here 
as an attribute of wisdom is that the wise have pureness of heart. But wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. Everything stems from a heart willing to be purified. First things first. Remember that purity is not perfection, but it's an attitude. God, I don't like what I see. I want to be more like you is a prayer that we should pray. In Titus, it says this, that everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure, but nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving because their minds and consciousness are corrupted. This is really describing the process of salvation, a transformed life, and that's why Jesus said in Matthew that blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. What is purity? What is pure? Well, without contamination. It's remaining and removing, keeping, remaining the things that are pure and removing the foreign, the foreign elements that would try to create imperfection. And what is impurity? Well, James 4 verse 4 explains it like this with some very intense language. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means separation or enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. We have to consider and look and address the contamination, the contaminants in our life, the impurities in our life. This is so important. We have to grapple with this. And it's not me that has to tell each of you what that looks like for your life. That's why we have the Holy Spirit to speak to us and to reveal what it is in our lives that he is highlighting, that he's asking us to to remove, to think about, to contend for, to see a transformation of heart, of lifestyle, of actions, of choice. James 4 says, come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands. Purify hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. The thing about God is that he's willing to reconcile with us. And I start with this one not to sound preachy, or that I'm coming down or judging. That is not my heart. My heart is that without the purity of heart, everything else won't work. It starts with the pure, the purity of heart. What did I say about purity? Well, it's without contamination, removing things that are distracting, removing the things that are creating thought in our heart that is not making space for the things that the Lord is desiring to speak to us. I can't tell you what that looks like for your life personally, but I do want to ask this one question before we move on. It is this. How much of the world am I going to allow into my life, into my everyday? This is a question that we all have to wrestle with and and through. Secondly, this morning, when it comes to attributes of wisdom, the wise love quiet gentleness. Other versions say peace. To be honest, I think that generationally right now around us, young and old, we love this this arguing. It's almost become a, a sport. Who agrees? We see this in our personal conversations, one-on-one, in groups. We see this on social media. We see this on platforms, in the news, different areas. There is this sense of arguing as something that has value. But the Bible says you can't be wise and love to argue with everyone all the time. I'll prove it to you. Here's some verses. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is peace-loving in James 3. James 1 says, Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Proverbs 4 says, A wise man controls his temper. 
He knows that anger causes mistakes. Proverbs 20 says, It's a mark of good character to avert quarrels, but fools love to pick fights. I started thinking about all of the conflicts that I've been uh, personally a pervy to and a part of over this year and even beyond. None of us are immune to this. We've all been in these environments or moments of our of our days and weeks. And guess what? The common denominator in all of these arguments, in all of these moments, was that, that I was a part of them. I was a part of them. So wherever there was argument, wherever there was... Toil and challenge and disconnect of heart. Everyone that I was present for, I was a part of. Therefore, it's on me. Not the person that I was with or the people that I was with, but it was on me. Maybe I shouldn't be so quick to argue with the person or the group, but if you're going to be a person who navigates through this crazy season, we need to love peace. We need to embrace peace. Now, I'm all about conf- conflict resolution. That is important. We need to challenge each other to be better. But conflict resolution takes two things. It takes both parties willing to listen. And often that is something that isn't happening right now where we're not getting dialogue back and forth where we're receiving from each other. So I believe there's even even higher call in beyond conflict resolution, and that's conflict revolution, where if God is with us and he's working through us and he is developing thought through our lives and in those moments, sometimes we just have to look beyond the moment that we're in, and a revolution of conflict is just to allow the Lord to work through us and bring peace to a situation, as opposed to trying to prove our point. I've needed this more than I've I've realized as I've reflected on it over this week. Conflict is not going to bring any sort of solution right now when it's done with The only resolve being our point being proven. Thirdly is the wise are courteous. But the wisdom that comes from heaven, James 3 says, is considerate. In other words, they don't think they always know. They make an attempt to understand. Who is wise and understanding among you? I read earlier in verse 13. In fact, you cannot separate wisdom from understanding because people who say, I've never thought of it that way, let me think about this. Are you courteous and considerate in these moments? We need more and more of this in our homes, in our marriages, in our dialogue with each other. Let me be considerate by considering your point of view your thought towards something. In fact, Paul is settling a challenge, a fight really among two groups of Christians. Sound familiar? One had a strong conviction about something than the other group did. It says this, we who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. It's maybe not a big deal to you, but it certainly is to the other party. The Bible says we must not just please ourselves. We should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. For even Christ didn't live to please himself. Romans 15 says. Building bridges with other people. I challenge all of us even over this next week and season uh, of Christmas that is coming to Meet with, connect with someone that you know you disagree with. That you know you have maybe philosophical disconnect or theological um, challenges between what you believe or, dare I say, political differences. 
And I challenge you to connect with that person or those people and seek to understand, seek to be considerate to where they're coming from and why they believe what they believe. We don't always see eye to eye with everybody, but we need to seek to understand where everyone is coming from in order to walk with wisdom. Because wisdom comes as one who is considerate and courteous of others. John Maxwell says it best with this point. He says, give your thoughts a break. You already think them. And be open to learning and gleaning. Whether you agree or not at the end is irrelevant. It's about seeking to understand the people that are in your life. Number four, the wise are willing to yield to others. In verse 17 of chapter 3, it says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is submissive or willing to yield. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. Imagine if we saw this on a platform of influence where two people that were debating their point of thought, even in a debate on TV where one party actually stopped and said, as someone was debating, and said, you know what? You're actually right. That's a very good point. Have we ever seen that in a presidential debate or a prime minister's debate or any sort of debate? We've, we just don't see that. But clearly, the wise are willing to yield to others. That, to me, is a better way. Sometimes you just know that one point of view is better than the other. And even if you're learning in that moment, I believe that God is asking all of us to keep our hearts open right now and not be so afraid of what is being talked about around us, but actually seeking to understand and, and learning from each other, even though it might not necessarily align with what you believe or think or what you have developed or adopted for your life. There's something about this that James is clearly telling us that the wise are willing to yield to others. The question on this one is, am I reasonable? Can I be reasoned with? Am I one that is slow to speak and quick to listen? Am I a trusted person where when someone is looking for a sounding board or someone to glean from, they think about you? That's a good tell of wisdom being active in your life, supernatural wisdom. Number five, as we move to a conclusion today, the wise minimize the mistakes of others. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is full of mercy. Full of mercy. That was horrible, but I'm going to forgive you for what you did, and I'll forgive you again, and I'll forgive you again, and I'll forgive you again. The Bible calls us towards. It's full of mercy and good fruit. Good fruit, James says. I'm going to forgive. There's something about letting things go that I believe is a huge tell that wisdom is active in our life. Letting go of the pain, letting go of the challenge of the discomfort. The Lord's been speaking to me so much about this even this week of the people or the opinions that I'm harboring right now, thinking of how ridiculous this person is or this way of thinking or this narrative that is so prevalent. And the Lord is, is saying, son, you are, to me, you are not being wise if you harbor this because wisdom minimizes the mistakes of others. It's full of mercy. By the grace of God, there is one area in my life that I really do believe I, I've never struggled with, and that is holding grudges, and I'm so thankful for that. 
think you need that in a pastoral role. Who agrees? Yeah. By God's grace only, where I, I, I forget very quickly. And I'm thankful for that. And I'm not, I'm not proud of that as I do that in my own strength. I really do believe it's the Lord giving me space to not hold on to things tightly. I really can't afford to because I have too many things that I need God to forgive in my own life than to hold on to everything else that's happened to me. To have any right to hold on to these grudges with someone is just not okay. James 2 says, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful because mercy triumphs over judgment. It's so powerful. I'd rather stand before God having loved too much than having judged really too harshly. If that's, if that's what I'm guilty for, then I'd rather that. Yes, that may bring on more vulnerability to be hurt and to be taken advantage of, but I think there's something about that that's so powerful. Being called out for loving too much than to be one who judges so harshly. It reminds me of the story. I love the story. I heard it a few weeks ago. I thought it to be so uh, perfect for, for today. It was two grandparents that were celebrating their 50th anniversary. And the granddaughter said to her grandma, what's the secret of your successful marriage, grandma? Well, she said, I decided to make a list of grandpa's 10 biggest faults when we first got married. But I decided to make that list, and then what I was going to do with that list, I was going to overlook those 10 faults for our entire marriage. Well, what was the list, Grandma? And Grandma responded, she said, well, actually, I, I never got around to writing them down. So every time that he did something that bothered me, I would say, well, lucky for him, it's on the list. Lucky for him, it's on the list. Your life, my life would be so much better if we lived like this. And I'm, I'm telling you, everyone, I, I'm speaking to my own life as I share these thoughts, as the Lord has been challenging me so, so in such a real way these last few days in this area. And lastly, today, wise are authentic. The wise are authentic. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is impartial and sincere. These two words derive, it's incredible, they derive from the word hypocrite, actually, in the Greek. By the way, hypocrite is not just a word, but it's actually a, a type of actor, a character in, in Greek culture, in Greek theater so many years ago, where an actor would play because maybe there was a shortage or this is how they did it, but an actor would play three or four different characters and they would put the mask on and they'd be that character. And then later on in this, in the play, they would be another character with a different mask and there would be three or four different roles. It all comes from that word hypocrite. Where the Bible tells us not to live like this. Interestingly enough, find this for whatever reason so interesting but we all of us we're living in a in a season right now where masks are very much a part of our life I understand why we're wearing the physical masks but we have to be so careful that we're not wearing these masks around our heart it's so important that we're not doing that where we're hiding certain things you can't hide and be wise you have to share with those that you trust what's really going on in your life because the wise are authentic. The wise create space in their life to be vulnerable with people that they trust. This is so important. And I conclude with this this morning, as I mentioned at the very beginning. In verse 18, we see this, this passage being summed up with a verse... Peacemakers who sow in peace 
reap a harvest of righteousness. So I ask this question, why does God want us to be wise? Well, it's right there in that passage, right there in that verse. Peacemakers who sow in peace will reap a harvest of righteousness. This is so fascinating as I was studying this, that in the Greek, in the original language, peacemaker actually means bringer of national tranquility. Bringer of national tranquility. Do you know that God wants you and I to live with wisdom so that we can go out into the world and infect people with the peace of God? That's what this ultimately comes down to. Your response is different than everyone else's response. The church of the living God is called to be sowers of peace around this world. That's that's what comes from a person who lives with wisdom. You are a bringer of national tranquility, a sower of peace into the world. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of that. Where when all around us, it's chaos and it's the challenge of looking to tomorrow and the next day, what is this holiday season going to look like? And what's January going to look like? And how are my kids? Or what's going to happen here? There's got to be a people that move in a rhythm that goes beyond what we see in the natural. There's got to be. But it has to be done with wisdom. Because sometimes just fighting against the man and uh, allowing your own personal convictions to be something that you shout from the mountaintops isn't always the best solution either. In order to create influence, we have to build trust. In order to build trust, we, we have to use wisdom. And in order for wisdom to be a part of our everyday, we have to be a pure heart. We have to have a quiet gentleness about us. We have to be courteous, willing to yield to others, be merciful and authentic. That is a person of wisdom. As I pray to conclude this morning, I would ask all of us to consider what this means for your life. As I've mentioned many times, this this book of James there's so much to learn and glean from for this season. If you have not been reading it, I, I, I strongly recommend you pull this book out on a daily basis and just work through it as we continue to work through it as a church. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. As you go today, I pray that wisdom would be your guide, God's wisdom, the spirit of wisdom, the gift of the spirit that we can desire for and ask God for. As we conclude, for anybody here today that is hearing these words and you're a part of this morning and you've just been experiencing something in your own heart that is that is different than what you maybe thought was going to happen today or you have maybe not experienced in a long time. I do believe it's the Lord coming with a gentle voice desiring to speak to your heart and to welcome you into his presence today. God is a patient God, and he loves the journey that we're on, and he's patient with us. There's moments in our life where he calls us forth and calls us out of how we live and what we are holding on to and what we are living for each day. Salvation is ultimately surrender. With surrender comes this beautiful journey of not having to live every day in our own strength, but being able to lean not on our own understanding, but acknowledging Him. And when
when we do that, he will direct us and he will guide us. It's this, this beautiful dance of taking, taking control away from you and giving it to him. It's not always easy, but I promise you, it will take you on a path and towards truth and towards a, an understanding of who God is when we surrender our lives to Jesus. A journey that will open up brand new for your day and for your life. As we conclude this morning, I want to pray for each person here. Let's bow our heads. If that's you today, and you said, Pastor Tim, I, I want to know more about Jesus. I want to, I want to learn more about this understanding of, of, of godly wisdom being my guide, about hearing the voice of God and, and allowing the things that have controlled my, my life, giving God the space to take those from me so that I have room in my heart to give him the space to lead me. If that's you today, we're going to pray this prayer. And I encourage you to pray this with me. Father, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Lord, you came today to speak to our hearts. You came to speak to each person in this room. You, it's your desire to take over, not in a controlling way, Lord, but in a way where we can cast our burdens upon you, where we can surrender and allow you to move us in a direction that finds freedom in our life, where we are healed from the hurts that have cause great pain from our past. There's a freedom that comes from that, Lord. And then ultimately we see you working through our lives where we can make a difference for others, a sense of identity and purpose and fulfillment. That is the fruit of a life surrendered to Jesus as it goes beyond our own selfish desires. Lord, I pray for anyone in this room today or anyone who's watching online this morning, if they are praying that prayer, would you just come and would you fill them with your spirit? Would you take from them the hurt and the trial and the fear? And would you replace that with your peace today all across this room? And for anyone listening today or this week, Lord, we ask for these things in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for each and every one here that, Father, wisdom would be our guide. There would be people of pure heart, that there would be a quiet gentleness about us that is so life-giving, that there would be a courtesy to our demeanor, a willingness to yield to others, to be one who listens more than who speaks someone that is full of mercy, that we can continue to forgive as Jesus forgave and, and ultimately that we would be people of authenticity and when we walk with these characteristics we can be confident that we are walking with the spirit of wisdom in our lives. I thank you for these things in Jesus name I pray. Amen. <laughs>